for biotechnology information um, in the United States. Um, I was asked to give a talk about, quote, genomics. I think what I'm going to do is a little more general than that, although we will um, get a chance to address some of the genomics issues. By the way, if you have your mic open, go ahead and mute yourselves so we don't have the feedback. Mm -hmm. And then when you need to talk, you can mute. Let me just see. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and get started. As Rolanda said, if you want the slides or um, actually the narrative for the demonstration I'm going to do today, uh, it's available in that compressed uh, link that you should see on the first slide that should be showing now. If you have any questions about anything we talk about today or anything about NCBI or anything in general, you feel free to write to me. My email address is fairly simple. It's peter.cooper at nih.gov. So you can write to me if you have any questions. Um, we're going to be talking about a, a wide range of things today. I'm going to tell you about NCBI, uh, who we are, what we do, what kind of things go on here. Um, then we're going to talk about some of the databases that people use at NCBI, uh, literature databases, sequence databases. We're going to talk, focus on central hub databases, the best places to get access to information. Then I'm going to talk about web-based tools for accessing that information, the Entree system. I'll explain what that is. BLAST, basic local alignment search tool, and also um, our genome browsers, which are really another way of searching the data. Then since this was supposed to be a genomics talk, I'll mention some of the more programmatic tools um, that some people call omics tools. We'll talk about those. I'll also show you how to download large sets of data briefly, um, at least show you where those things are. And then as time permits, we're going to do some live stuff on the web, which is more fun than looking at slides. OK, first of all, just um, let me just remind you or tell you who we are, since um, this is not a talk that's going into the United States. I just want to mention that this is we are the National Center for Biotechnology Information. Uh, and I've sort of broken down the URL of our web page there. It sort of is a bureaucratic URL that explains who we are and what we're part of. Um, our website, of course, is on the World Wide Web. And then uh, we are the National Center for Biotechnology Information. We are one of the divisions of the National Library of Medicine. And those two buildings on that slide right there belong to the National Library of Medicine. We're on the main campus of the National Institutes of Health uh, in Bethesda, Maryland, which is right outside of the capital, Washington, D.C., and we're part of the U.S. federal government. Um, the center, NCBI, has been around since 1988 with these very broad goals that keep sort of expanding and changing over time. Establish public databases, do research in computational biology, we develop software tools, we disseminate biomedical information. We are also, one of the busiest government, U.S. government websites on the internet, um, you can see the statistics here. And this is just a graph of the growth of web traffic at the NCBI website over time. You can see peaks and valleys there. The peaks correspond to sort of vacation times in the U.S. and uh, um, Western Europe, the Christmas and New Year's and things like that. Um, and these numbers keep going up all the time. And this is essentially an exponential growth curve. So a little more detail about what we do. Um, these are sort of the things that I think are important. There are lots of other things too, but um, these are some of the things we offer and what we're a part of. First of all, we archive and provide access to submitted DNA sequences and their corresponding proteins. And this is a part of something called the International Sequence Database Collaboration that includes GenBank at the NIH. European Nucleotide Archive at the European Bioinformatics Institute in the United Kingdom, and the DNA Data Bank of Japan at uh, the National Institute of Genetics. You can see all those sequences at the NCBI site. We also have lots of other biomolecular data. In particular, um, the largest chunk of the molecular data at NCBI are these next-gen uh, sequence data, uh, the short read archive stuff, and I'll talk more about that uh, later. Human sequence variations. So we have a, a SNP database, we have chemical information, we have chemical structures, and we have gene expression information. The busiest part of our service is actually the part that has to do with the biomedical literature, um, where we have a service called PubMed, and we have free access to the abstracts. We have some free text in the form of our PubMed central database. 
And those are free to anybody all over the world, the ones that are in PubMed Central. We also curate and provide access to sets of reference sequences and their interpretations. So for example, we're part of the collaboration that assembles the human genome and annotates them. So the human genome, the mouse genome, the zebrafish genome, and now the chicken genome are assembled by a consortium of people and NCBI provides annotation for those things. We're also, one of the projects I'll just mention, although it's not as relevant for people outside the US, is we're part of this pathogen detection project in the US where we're trying to uh, help track down the sources of foodborne illness, which is a big project for us. It's across a whole bunch of public health agencies and government agencies in the US. And of course, we build these web-based tools that we're gonna talk about today. And this is just another sort of exponential growth grab that shows you the growth of GenBank. That's that blue line, which is sort of our core database. That core database, of course, we'll see in a moment, has become um, basically a pinpoint compared to the next gen data. Just want to bring that to your attention. And these are some sort of highlights on the timeline when we have launched various kinds of activities over time. And you can see that the growth of the data tracks pretty much the growth of our web traffic, which is the red line. So the other, the other graph that I think is rather dramatic to show is um, the growth of the next generation sequencing data at NCBI, which is part of our sequence read archive database. Uh, it dwarfs GenBank. GenBank would not even appear as a point on this graph. It's down there in the X um, axis. It's five times 10 to the 11th bases in GenBank but there's two times 10 to the 16th bases that are present as next-gen data at NCBI. We'll look at some of that next-gen data today, actually. So let's talk a little bit about um, what databases there are in a little bit in slightly more detail than I've already done it, and then we'll talk about how to access them. So I mentioned these literature databases a moment ago, and this just gives you some statistics about what's in there. PubMed is free access to the biomedical literature. Um, there are lots of citations in there. There are also a number of them, about 5 million of them, that are available in our PubMed Central database. And so you can see the full text of many of these. In the United States, anybody that's funded by NIH has to provide full text for the publications. And so those things do go into our PubMed Central database. We also have online textbooks, and all of our help manuals are in that. A lot of them are in that um, part of NCBI as well. There's about 6,000 textbooks, reference works, and various kinds of things in there that everybody has free access to. These are the sequence databases that you can get to on the web. And for each one of these slides, I've given you a direct uh, link to those particular resources. Uh, you can also Google most of them and find us as the first hit, of course. Um, the nucleotide database, which contains GenBank, plus these things, that, these reference sequences that I already mentioned. You can take a look at the number of records that are in there on the slide. Protein database, um, which contains the translations of the International Sequence Database sequences, as, as well as our reference sequences. We also import some outside databases there as well, like SwissPro um, and PDB as protein sequences. And then there is our sequence read archive, and that's our next generation archive. Um, and it's really not something that you can do a very good job of searching on the web. That requires some standalone omics type tools to get access to it. And that's the largest set of molecular data at NCBI. Just a couple of points about our reference sequences. These are sequences that we produce and own. Um, we do not sequence anything. In other words, we don't perform experiments. What we do is we take sequences that are submitted to the INSDC and we either merge them to make larger sequences, we edit them somewhat, and we provide our own annotation. Um, we intend these to be a reference standard. So if you want a particular sequence for a particular gene or its products, here's where you would go is to try to get our reference sequences. They also have distinct identifiers that you can recognize. And so these are the ones here at the bottom of this slide where you can see the uh, these prefixes, so genomic sequences would be have a C and an N in front of them with this underscore. So all reference sequences have this underscore character and a two-letter prefix. So you can recognize the kind of sequences that they are by those prefixes. And then here are some other databases that I'm going to give sort of short shrift here, although they're very important. 
Uh, these are variation databases, expression databases, structure, and chemical databases. So for variation, we have ClinVar for clinically relevant uh, variants in the human genome. Um, DBSNP and DBVAR is a general databases for large or small and large scale variants. Gene expression, we have um, this resource called the Gene Expression Omnibus that contains curated and data sets and experiments, as well as profiles of the genes that we've curated across those. And we'll take a look at one of those today, I think if we have time. We also have RNA-seq alignment. So this is next-gen data that are present in the gene database. We use them uh, to annotate genomes. And we can also get some expression information by counting those, looking at the tissues they're coming from. We also import biomolecular structures from PDB, the Protein Data Bank of Structure Database here. Um, and we have about 140,000 3D structures of proteins, DNA uh, or nucleic acid structures, and complexes of those things. And there's also PubChem, which has chemical information for about 97 million compounds. And those are the URLs for those various resources as well. One of the things I want to point out is that if you're coming to NCBI, it can be a little bit overwhelming to search all these, to see all these different databases. There are some central hubs that are good places to start. Uh, the taxonomy database, the bioproject database, the assembly database, and the gene databases are all good central starting points. Um, I'll talk a little bit about what's in there in a moment, or right here, as a matter of fact. So taxonomy is very important at NCBI. This is the way we collect data for a particular taxon, and this is the main controlled vocabulary across all of our molecular databases. So you can do these organism fielded searches to make sure that you're getting data for a particular organism, and that can be any taxon from a species level, subspecies level, all the way up to uh, a super kingdom. So that was, that's the kind of query that's a very useful. There are lots of complicated queries you can do at NCBI. This basic one is a pretty helpful one. Bioproject is a central point for collecting data from a single project. It's organized by that because there are lots of projects that generate multiple types of data. Uh, for example, you might generate next-gen sequencing data, you might generate protein data, you might generate um, regular nucleotide sequence data, and it will come out at, at the bioproject level. You can find all of it. Assembly is another database where you have to bring together lots of different pieces, and assembly is basically the sequences that correspond to a particular genome, like the human genome, where you're gonna have sequences for all the chromosomes. You might have sequences for pieces that don't quite fit anywhere, and you have to put the annotation on there too. So you wanna collect all that stuff in a single point. So the assembly is a central point for going there if you're interested in a genome assembly and you wanna get the data for that. And finally, what I think of as the central resource at NCBI for lots of things, molecular, is gene. Because most people, when they come to our database, are interested in a gene or its products. If you want to find data for a particular gene or the protein product of that gene or expression information about a gene, just about anything you can think of, variations in a gene, you would come to the gene database. So how do you search this stuff on the web? They're basically um, three ways. The third way is a little bit odd, and I'll come back to that in a minute. Um, the first two are the main web search systems. Um, and the first one is the thing that we call the entree system. And this is what you do, what you're using when you come to our web pages and you type something into a box and you click search. Um, there's 40 integrated databases here. Um, and you can use these complex fielded queries if you want. And this is the main engine behind PubMed, which is the one that most people wind up searching. The other main way in for searching is BLAST, which is our uh, sequence similarity search tool. BLAST stands for Basic Local Alignment Search Tool. This is a way of identifying sequences that are similar to the one you're using as a query. You have to have a sequence as a starting point here. Um, originally designed to find homologs and other species. It's used now for all kinds of sequence analysis tasks, and lots of annotation tasks too. Just a little more about the entree system. You can search it all at once with this URL on the slide where it's just NCBI followed by search. Um, it's a little daunting because there's a, more than 40 databases there. If you could potentially get hits in all of them. And like I said, where do you start? Typically, you just want to start in one of these 
central databases, gene assembly, taxonomy, and bioproject, as I mentioned a moment ago. Um, if you're interested in using their sequence similarity search tools, this is what the BLAST homepage is like. So you can pick the particular flavor of BLAST you want to start with, whether you're going to start with a nucleotide sequence, a protein sequence, or a translation, or you want to translate one of those things. You can also get access to specific genome pages. There's also some tools on here that aren't really BLAST at all, but are specialized kinds of tools. In particular, a popular one is Primer BLAST. We won't have time to demonstrate that today, but that's a very useful tool for designing primers for a particular target or for checking your primers to see if they're going to be specific in a particular uh, target uh, set of sequences. So the third way, which I think is a little bit different um, of accessing our data, is through the genome browsers. And um, the main one that we have is the Genome Data Viewer. There's also the Thousand Genomes Browser and the Variation Viewer. Um, and so you have lots of tools and widgets here for manipulating things, but you can go in here and search for a gene or you can load a particular chromosome and look at the information on that. Okay, so leaving the web, let me just point out some things that um, are available for doing some standalone types of analyses or local analyses on data. So there is programmatic access available to our databases. Um, to the Entree system, there are a, set, a suite of URL-based application, pro, URL application programming interfaces called the eUtilities. Um, there's a very good document about how to use those. Basically, these would require that you write a script to access um, our search engine. And you can do all the same things that you can do with the Entree system on the web by using a program. So you can get data locally to your computer. You can get data down in structured formats like XML and JSON or parsing. Because a lot of people may be familiar with the command line but don't want to write scripts, we do have a set of pre-built scripts called eDirect that you can download. And that's part of that manual that's linked at the top of this slide. So if you want to learn more about eDirect, it's there as well. There's also a structured API or URL syntax that you can use to access BLAST through scripts. And we're working on um, developing some access through an API to um, the variation services, including things like dbSNP. And that's kind of under development, but you can take a look at that web page there to learn more about that. The standalone tools that people can download um, and work with locally um, there's a regular BLAST, which you can download the databases and the search tools. Magic BLAST, which is our next generation alignment program. Um, the advantage of that is that you can access SRA and the assemblies from NCBI over the internet without having to download an entire experiment from SRA, which can be quite large. And speaking of SRA, if you're interested in working with next gen data, you need to really be familiar with the SRA toolkit which is a suite of standalone tools for accessing, downloading, manipulating SRA. And the links to those various things are on the side of this slide on the right-hand side. And our, our FTP site is a very similar address to the one we have for our web page. So if you go into BLAST, you can get all these tools. Um, we have a, a GitHub site for a lot of our tools, and the wiki on um, the SRA toolkit is probably the best place to go to find out more about that. Just to point out, all of these things allow you to have remote access to NCBI, so they do work as clients, so you don't necessarily have to download everything to be able to use these, download all the databases. A couple things about downloading data. Um, in general, we've already mentioned some of these services and protocols, um, the SRA toolkit. There are also FTP areas that you should be familiar with for downloading the assemblies. The RefSeq assemblies are the ones that I would definitely tend to emphasize, and that's this directory here. Um, there is a download FAQ that explains how to use these directories if you're going to access them with command line tools. There are also two things for um, getting things directly out of the web. One is the send to menu in Entree, and the other one is the download function in the assembly database. I'll just show you the slide that points those out in detail. 
So here's an example um, of the entree sinto menu. I'm looking at a chromosome from Plasmodium vivax, a malaria parasite. If I wanted to, I could download um, the coding sequences off of that directly from the web. And that's the sinto menu in the upper right when you're looking at a web page and entree. Um, I can also download, for example, all these protein sequences that I have here in FASTA format if I wanted to get them locally. And this is for medium-sized sets of data, not for enormous sets, not the human genome, for example. Uh, on the assembly pages, you have this download feature that would let you download um, any of the files that are available on the FTP site that are annotation files, sequence files, and so on and so forth about the assembly. So this is a pretty handy way to do that. If you're interested in a small number of files from these, you can do multiple assemblies, but this can get quite large. And if that's the case, you might want to go to the FTP site directly with a script to get these things out. Okay. So a lot of the stuff I'm going to show you right now, I'm going to give you sort of a whirlwind demo in a minute. Um, Many of the things I'm going to show you are available in other forms. In particular, I want to point out to you that we have a blog, the NCBI Insights blog, where we talk about a lot of the resources that I've already mentioned. Um, there's a learn page where you can go to find out about webinars and things like that that we're presenting on the internet that anybody can attend. There is a set of fact sheets on the FTP site that are very good and fairly comprehensive about any of the resources and others that I uh, haven't talked about. And then finally, there is our YouTube channel. And we present webinars two to three times a month. Those all get recorded and they get put up on YouTube. Um, we also have some tutorials on there that are just sort of these Camtasia-based videos where someone goes through and points out how to do a particular task. So um, there are lots of videos there, so it's worth checking that out if you want to learn more about things. OK. So in the remaining time, I'm going to run through an example that starts in one of the central databases and takes you across a bunch of different resources. And this one is sort of about malaria and sort of about population genetics. Um, and so probably many people that are listening or watching this already know this. I had to learn this myself uh, over the past couple of weeks because I just wanted to do an example that had some relevance for tropical diseases. Um, so there is a protein on the surface of red blood cells. It's called the Duffy blood group antigen. Um, it's a product of this gene uh, called ACKR1. Um, expressed on red blood cells and reticulocytes um, in humans <coughs> and other mammals as well. One of the malaria parasites, Plasmodium vivax, uses or binds to the Duffy blood group antigen to attach itself to reticulocytes, which are sort of the primitive stages of red blood cells, and invade them. Um, so this is an important um, protein for that reason. And it seems to be one of these things where malaria has had a big impact on human population genetics. And there are a bunch of different sort of phenotypes. You can either have an A antigen, Duffy A antigen or a Duffy B antigen, or you cannot express the Duffy gene at all. Uh, and so these are some common uh, genotype-phenotype combinations. There are others as well. So you know you can look at the promoter and see what base is there. There are two common possibilities. Either there is a T there or a C there. If you have the T, then you will express the antigen. If you have a C there, you will not express the antigen in your red blood cells or in your reticulocytes. There are also some coding region variants. Um, at position 125 of the coding sequence, if you have a G there, you will have a glycine. This is called the Duffy A antigen. Um, if you have a, an A there, you will have an aspartate amino acid at that position, and this is called the Duffy B antigen. Um, and it turns out what's interesting about this is that um, people in the tropical regions of Africa, in the equatorial regions of Africa, are almost all Duffy negative. They don't express this uh, blood group antigen on the red blood cells. And it, it's believed that that's because it's part of the resistance to this particular malaria parasite. Now, that doesn't have a huge impact on infection by 
of falciparum malaria, which is, I think, the major problem in Africa. Um, and so we'll, we'll see some population genetic examples where we can take a look at that particular thing. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to talk a little bit. We've already talked a lot about the biology. Um, and what I want to demonstrate is that all the things I just said, you can learn, and I did, by starting in our gene database and just sort of linking out to various things. So we're going to start in gene, look at sequences, splice variants, isoforms for the products, look at the genomic structure, look at gene expression, look at the variance in population genetics, take a look at some aligned next-gen data from the Thousand Genomes Project and outside of the Thousand Genomes Project. We'll use BLAST to do a little bit of that. We'll try to find an ortholog in another species, another primate, um, and then we'll take a little bit of a trip over to look at protein structure and function, um, and we will use that as a way to navigate back to the parasite itself. So we'll get back to the Plasmodium vivax genome, and we'll look at the gene that binds to the Duffy blood group antigen, so the Plasmodium protein that helps it attach. Okay. So I'm going to switch over to a web browser. I'm just going to escape out of my slides if I can. Yeah, that's a little ugly on the recording, but let's we'll go with that. And so what I'm going to do over here is start a demo, and I'm going to bump up the font on the web page a little bit. Okay, so this is our homepage. You can find it pretty easily by just Googling NCBI. Okay, so let's go ahead and search, and we'll just search for Duffy blood group as a search term. And I'm going to pick the gene database from here. So when you come to gene, you get a series of results. They're sorted by what's called relevance. If there's nothing particularly special about your query, that often means by how recently they were updated. Typically, what you'll find is that the human gene is at the top, and so that's the case here. Um, notice that you can do lots of filtering here. If you wanted to search for all human genes, you could do that here. You could download a table of the human genes sorted by the position on the chromosome. It's a very handy thing to be able to do. But let's not spend too much time on that right now. I just want to point out to you that this is where the send to menu is that I mentioned in the slides a minute ago. So let's go ahead and visit the gene record for the Duffy blood group antigen. Notice that it has um, a name. It actually has the biochemical function. It's called the atypical chemokine receptor 1. And we'll uh, look a little bit more at that function uh, towards the end of the demo. Okay, so this is a human gene record. Notice that there's a nice summary of the biology that we already talked about right here. All things about aliases, links of links to um, orthologs and other species, and we'll use those in a little bit. Um, other sources for this particular gene. And this table of contents on the right-hand side is kind of useful because it will let us navigate this fairly large record. Just let me since we've talked about assemblies, let me just go down here to the genomic context section of the record for a minute. Um, notice that you can link here to the assembly. Okay, and notice this, this odd-looking um, identifier here. These are assembly accession numbers. So I can go from this current assembly, which is um, called GRC, Genome Reference Consortium, Human Build 38. Patches have to do with um, updates to the sequence that are not rolled into it. And you could go over here and open this if you wanted to. And for the Human Genome Assembly, this is a rather complex record. You've got access to all the different chromosome sequences here, either the, the submitted version, the RefSeq version. There are kinds, of different kinds of things here. There is the primary assembly, which is the chromosome backbone. There are also patches which are updates, and there are these alt-ref loci things that have to do with off-backbone sequences that are there to capture this sort of diversity. 
of the human genome because this is really a haploid assembly that represents predominantly a single person, as a matter of fact, although there's components of other people in there as well. Okay, so I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but I will point out to you that you can uh, download things here from the record. You can go to these links here to download the RefSeq assembly to get all the different files that go along with the assembly of the human genome. Okay, so we're back over here. And the, what we know from looking at what people do at the gene record, which is a logical thing to do, is to quickly go to the reference sequences. This is a very good place to come. If you want the sequences for this particular gene, go to gene, click on this link, which is just the table of contents link, and right there at the bottom, you have access to the sequences. Here are two different transcripts. This is the transcript we're gonna be working with today. There are two different ones that we have evidence for from uh, data that has been submitted. Um, and there's a corresponding protein translation. So notice the RefSeq style accession numbers, M for mRNA, P for protein. There's also a third kind of record here, which is the RefSeq gene record. This is a nice record if you are interested in a particular gene because it will tell you where things are on the gene and it will be stable. So we have a thing up here that says this is independent of the annotated genomes. This record is a standalone record representing this gene. It's pretty handy because it won't change every time we build the genome. Because when we build the genome, which won't happen anytime real soon, this region may change. Now, the internal coordinates of the gene on chromosome one probably won't, but exactly where it is on chromosome one will. So that's the purpose of that RefSeq gene record. So here we can just download the region of chromosome one if we wanted to that contains this annotated gene. We'll come back to this section a, a little bit later on. Okay, now we mentioned that this gene is expressed in red blood cells and reticulocytes. And uh, notice that there's a histogram here. Uh, these are counts from RNA-seq data of some different tissues that show expression for this gene or low expression for the gene or high expression for this gene. Um, this thing has sort of a broad expression pattern here. You'll notice that, of course, there are no um, red blood cells or red blood cell precursors here that I can identify. Um, so we don't have complete information. We just know what information is in those libraries. You can change the libraries that are represented here. This is the Human Protein Atlas. Um, there are other ones here. The Human Protein Atlas has multiple samples. Here's the Illumina body map, which does not have multiple samples, and so on and so forth, for each tissue, that is. Um, and the units here are reads um, per kilobase per million reads placed. So they're sort of a normalized count. There is a database that deals with expression, and I'll just take a quick trip over there. Let me show you this. This is Geo Profiles. Okay. And so these are various kinds of microarray experiments. Um, and so remember that these genes are on these microarrays. There are probes for them, and a lot of times they're just sort of along for the ride. And you might not expect anything um, interesting to happen with a particular gene. So you need to sort of know what data set you're looking at. And that's the name that we give for these curated experiments. Here's one that shows some different patterns of expression under different conditions. Um, for example, there are some um, data sets in here that have to do with you know, surveying expression across all kinds of different tissue types. So I'm just going to do a little search over here. I'll search for the gene. So notice these are the probes for this ACKR1 gene. Um, and I'll search for um, this study that I know is in here, but I can always find it. So the name of it's large scale analysis of the human transcriptome. There's actually more than one of those. So here we have two of them. And what we have here is sort of a, a rendering of the counts or the, the, the signal on the microarray. And I'll take a look at this second one. Uh, 
I'll zoom in a little bit on that. I hope that's visible. It's kind of small writing. But one of the things I'll point out is this um, CD71 early, erith early erythroid cells, CD71 plus. These are basically the kind of progenitor cells that would give rise, that would turn into reticulocytes and would turn into uh, red blood cells ultimately. So you can see very high level expression. In fact, it's the highest level expression on this microarray for that particular um, tissue type. So we have some confirmation of the expression in reticulocytes or at least their progenitors when we looked at it here in the microarray sense. Okay, let's go back to the gene record now and we'll take a look at some of the variants that I've already mentioned a little bit. So I can uh, just link back to gene through this link here. Okay. Let me zoom back out a little bit because I've got pretty big there. And what I want to do now is there are lots of ways to look at the variants, but what I'm going to do is to look at this genome sort of graphical view of the genome here. There are lots of tracks here, and there's you know a tremendous amount we could do here, but we don't really have time to go over all this. What I'm going to do is, first I'm going to clean this up. I'm going to get rid of the tracks that I don't want to see, um, just to make it a little bit easier. Um, so I got rid of the ensemble annotation, and I got rid of a couple of other things that had nothing in this region. This is uh, RNA-seq data plotted on here. Uh, the counts and so evidence for the presence of these transcripts. And let me go ahead and close that. I'm just hitting the X there. Um, the other thing that's kind of useful to be able to do is, and so now we have variation tracks. Here's the SNP data. Here are the things from ClinVar. They have these little nice little markers here to tell you where they are. And then we can change the way this looks just so we can take a look. These are two different splice variants that represent the two transcripts, and I can go ahead and expand this. If I put my mouse pointer over a particular track header, I can click on that little gear icon, and I can change the way this looks. So it's useful to, I'm going to project the SNPs onto the protein by doing that one. And I'm going to show everything. So if we put, click show all and apply that, then we can see um, here are two transcripts. We're going to focus on this uh, 2x on one here. Um, and here are the two corresponding proteins lined up there. And here are some variants. Now, I will just tell you because I already did the sort of uh, analysis we want to do that this one, if you link to ClinVar, you'll find out that that is the SNF that's associated with um, absent expression for. Um, this gene. So that's the CT polymorphism there. Um, we're going to focus on this one. This is a coding region variant. And so there it is, the RS12075. And we're going to visit ClinVar to find to look at that one. Uh, and this will change the coding region uh, sequence there from the G to a um, spart from glycine to a spartate. We can zoom in if we want to. I'll go ahead and zoom to sequence that marker, or zoom to sequence. Looks like I missed it a little bit. Oops. That was like a live demo to show you how. Okay, we can see that this is an A to G change in the DNA sequence. And if that ever loads, we'll see that that is a glycine to aspartate change in the protein sequence here. And it doesn't matter which of these two protein sequences, it's going to be the same codon, it's changing from a GDT to a GAT. Okay. So let's go ahead and visit ClinVar. So I'll go ahead and just click that from this pop up.
the ClinVar is a place where people submit variants about um, things that have clinical importance. Um, this one is actually taken from a literature database called OMIM. Uh, these are processed automatically. And we can see the changes that happen here. So we have um, the variant here. There's a glycine at position 125 of the coding region of this transcript. And it's changed to an A. Now notice that this transcript has a G. That's what that means here. And so that means that the reference genome is actually uh, showing the Duffy A genotype um, there. And here's the change from the protein. So the corresponding protein has a glycine there. The Duffy B would be changing that to an aspartate. And we can take a look quickly about um, population genetics information by clicking over here to the Thousand Genomes browser. There are also some aggregated data here. Uh, notice that the minor allele frequencies is, are different in these two sets. This is uh, the Grand Opportunity Exome Sequencing Project. Um, and 69% of these people, of the genotypes there, have an A as the minor allele. For the global minor allele frequency, which is coming from 1,000 genomes, the minor allele is a G. And we can see why that's the case, because it has to do with what kinds of populations are included in these particular studies. This is a, a polymorphism, so it's highly variable, and it's different in different human populations. So let me open this. This is going to take us to the 1,000 Genomes browser. And so this column that's highlighted here shows us what the different population frequencies are. are. Here's the overall population frequency here, 45% um, G, 55% A. Uh, and remember, A is the Duffy uh, B, and G will be the Duffy A. But notice that it that the whichever one's a minor a little changes depending upon the population that you're in. Uh, in particular, let's take a look at some African population. So here are the Isan and Nigeria. 100% of these people have an A at that position. And so we would say that that allele is fixed. So they're fixed at the Duffy B. Likewise, here's some Gambians fixed at the Duffy B. And here's the Luya in Kenya fixed at Duffy B and so on and so forth. And that's because in these populations, this is linked to another, to a haplotype that includes that Duffy um, minus variant. We could even prove that to ourselves if we wanted to by searching up here for the Duffy minus variant. But I won't do that just to save some time. But you can try it yourself if you want, and you'll see that all those African populations where they are fixed for the Duffy B, they're also fixed for not expressing it. And that has to do with probably selection pressure from malaria. OK, so what if we wanted to investigate this in another group of people, we could do some things with the BioProject to find some other data. Let me do a quick one for you. So let me change the database here to BioProject. And there is a sequence that I know about, or a project that I know about, where they sequenced a, um, they got some sequences from a dead person who died 4,000 years ago in Ethiopia. So I'm just searching BioProject. Remember, this is where we can find data by project. And here is the BioProject record. There are links to um, next-gen sequencing data in SRA. I'll go ahead and open that one up directly. I won't open a new tab for that. And we can see that there are two runs. There's uh, various kinds of information here, but what I'm going to do is to focus on this shorter run here um, that has, um, you notice that even the smaller run is three, 33 gigabases of uh, DNA data. This happens to be one that was submitted as with alignments. So I can go over here to the alignments. And I can open this up in that viewer that we've been looking at. So I'll open this in the sequence viewer. And just by luck, we're getting chromosome 1 by default. And the gene we're looking at, I should have pointed this out, is on chromosome 1. So 
So this is the same viewer that's in Gene. It's just that we're looking at um, a standalone version of it. Pop that up. So if you got your mic open, go ahead and mute yourself because I heard some echo there. Um, what we're going to do is find our gene. In the viewer. Okay, and this is the old name for this gene, dark. It's the same, it's the same gene. I'll double click on it to get there. So we recognize that. Um, and I will tell you that the SNP we're going to look for is right in here. So you can sort of see an idea that there is something going on there. Let's go ahead and add that as a track. We don't have all the tracks in here. So I'm going to configure the tracks and get back the variation tracks that were present. So let me go ahead and put the ClinVar short variations, which we saw a minute ago in Gene. And now we can see where our variant is. If we recognize it, I hope. And so here are the alignments of the next gen data to the genome there. And you can see that um, this person who died 5,000 years ago almost uh, was a heterozygote. So they had um, the Duffy A and the Duffy B alleles. There's another example you can do, which uh, if you want to, you can download my document and try it yourself, where you can check. Uh, I did a blast search with this, which I won't demonstrate for you right now, but these are the results. And this is looking at um, the genome uh, data for a extinct kind of human, the inhabitants of the Denosova cave in Siberia. Uh, and I'm just going to change the way this looks. I'm uh, modifying the blast. So we can see pairwise with dots for identities. We can identify where there are variants. We're going to put the coding region feature on there from the query. What I did was I ran a search with the chemokine receptor, the coding region of it. Here are the next gen alignments here. Let me go ahead and reformat that. Takes a minute to load them. And we can take a quick look here. So the position should be 42 in the coding region here. And you can see that this particular individual, where we have that base present, like here, they were carrying the Duffy um, B genotype. So they have the uh, A there that would code for an aspartate in that particular position. This, these are people from Siberia that were alive about 30 million years ago. I think that's right. 30,000, I'm sorry, 30,000 years ago. Right. Okay. And that was using SRA blasts on the web to do that particular one. All right, let's quickly go back and wrap this up by doing some protein related things. So I'm back to the gene record. Um, let's go ahead and find a homolog in a related species. So what we can do is go to the um, all link here, and that will give us the calculated orthologs that we have created by doing our genome annotation pipeline. Um, and whenever we do that on a genome, we can figure out what the relationship is between the gene and the human gene. This is available for vertebrates. We can quickly pick out a relevant organism here. Here's the rhesus monkey, for example. This is an organism that can contract malaria and also has a Duffy blood group antigen. So we've now navigated across to a different gene with access to a different assembly and all the other resources that go with it. And if I want to, I can see how the rhesus macaque protein sequence compares to the human one. Notice that these are XPs. These are, these are based on next-gen alignment. So we, we, these are sort of preliminary gene model sequences. And I could just run a blast with that if I want to. And I'm again, I'm going to go ahead and just show you the result. Here's what it looks like. I just limited my blast result to human. And you can see that I found the two isoforms of the human chemokine receptor here. Um, and 
I now can take a little bit of information about the function of this. You can see that there's a link to this conserved domain here. And if I go over there and I go through to the conserved domain, multiple sequence alignment where it's highlighted residues for me that are important in peptide binding. And this is from, and you can see that there's a nice description of what this domain does in the protein. This is um, a sort of a promiscuous binder of cytokines. Uh, and there's some information about what they believe this does. Instead of, you know, not just how it binds to the duffy binding protein in plasmodium, but, but how it works normally in biology. Okay, so that's how you can find structural information from the conserved domains. And let me go back to my blast results. I gotta get this thing out of the way if I can. And one last thing I wanna show, and let's go back here. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and retrieve, I'm gonna go back and retrieve the human protein. But notice, oh, one of the things I wanted to point out to you, if we were thinking about the Duffy A, uh, B polymorphism, this is the macaque sequence up on the top. Notice that at the position, it's sort of like this particular one anyway. It's kind of like the Duffy um, A, um, B antigen, sorry, this is the aspartate. Whereas remember that our reference genome for human has the glycine there. Now this is a pretty variable region of the protein anyway, so they may be polymorphic there as well. The last thing I want to show you is linking to the protein here, which you can do from the gene record. Here is the protein record for that. And notice that we have an ad over here for some 3D structures. So we can go from here to our structure database. What's interesting about the structure is it just contains a fragment of the um, Duffy antigen protein from human, but what it is bound to is the Plasmodium vivax Duffy binding protein. So we have now navigated from the human to Plasmodium, and if we want to, we can actually look at that structure. Um, if I just put, I can click on this view in IC in 3D, and it basically will give me a three-dimensional view of the protein structure. This is a web-based viewer. And there are two proteins here. Um, this fragment over here is the piece of the extracellular part of the Duffy antigen. Um, and this is the binding protein from Plasmodium vivax. And so you can manipulate things in this viewer to add side chains, for example. You can zoom in to see how those side chains interact and form that binding pocket or that helical portion of this extracellular part of the Duffy binding protein binds. I'll go back to the structure record. And this is the full record. I launched CN 3D from there. I mean, I see in 3D from there directly, which I could get here. And notice that here on the record, there is a link back to gene. So now we're back in gene. For Plasmodium vivax. And here we can see the annotation. There's our graphical sequence viewer, just like we had before. Reference sequences are available here. Um, And I am now in gene, and I can do all the kinds of things I did before. Um, with the human record, I could do the same thing for the plasmodium record here. OK, so that was a lot. Let me stop there. And we, I think we have a few minutes for questions, if anybody has anything.
Okay, so somebody asked to send the link to materials, and um, I think that should be in the chat pod already, but I can put it back in there again. Let me go back to my slide, and I will put it in there. Hi, Peter. I can okay. just copy it, and then I can paste okay. it again. I'll put it in again, so that's fine. It's there. Do you see it again? Yes. Okay. Okay, looks like that person got it. And I'll go ahead and put my email address in there. If anybody has a question, I'll, it'll just give you access to that too, although it's pretty simple. I'll just write it. It's probably easier in copying it. <laughs> okay, so if anybody wants to ask me a question, you can certainly write to me there. So, so I see a couple more. Yes, the questions are coming in. The presentation is recorded. We can send it. So you did, we did record it, right? Yes. It's still recording. So I do see a question um, about um, Person says this technique is ideal for results from SNPs, sequences, et cetera. What's the best tool for intergenic SNPs? That is a really good question. Um, and to be honest with you, at NCBI, we're not annotating those on the on the sequences anymore. I think you probably know that, and that might be why you asked that question. Um, I don't know the answer to that question, so I can get back to you. Um, after I look into that a little bit more, I'm not sure what the status of those SNPs are right now at NCBI in, in any case, because we do not provide them as part of the annotation. We don't annotate energenic SNPs anymore. Whether we're keeping them or not is another question. 